All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, we are trying to build NLP products not only for NLP developers at DeepSet, but everywhere, basically. Um, and today I'll be talking about building a personal assistant with Haystack and GPT. And more specifically, I want to focus on uh, how to feed facts to large language models and how to reduce uh, hallucinations. Um, just a few words about myself. I'm Mattis. Um, I work as a lead product manager at DeepSet. I've been an NLP engineer before. Um, I live in Berlin, and when I'm not working on NLP products, I like to climb. Um, normally at DeepSet, I work on our uh, commercial product, DeepSet Cloud, but this is not um, what I'm talking about today. Today, I'll be talking about um, Haystack. What is Haystack? Um, Haystack is an open source framework. Some of you might know it. It's um, pretty much targeted at pragmatic developers who want to build production-grade applications with large language models. And as such, um, it comes pretty much with batteries included, so it provides a vast range of file and document converters, pre-processing, vector databases, uh, such as Pinecone or Elasticsearch or Quadrant. Um, you can use embedding or hybrid retrieval, and then you can, of course, connect to many um, different models. You can use open source models, um, everything on the, on the Hugging Face Hub, for example, but you can also use commercial large language models like uh, OpenAI's models or Cohere's models. And you can use these for pretty much any NLP task. So one of them, which is pretty buzzwordy right now, definitely generative AI. But you can also do um, more classical things like extractive question answering, named entity recognition, classification, like everything uh, wrapped into kind of a neat uh, pipeline abstraction that lets you build an NLP application from end to end with everything you need. All right. And what are we building today? So I really wanted to walk you through this end-to-end -end building experience today as well. So what we are building is a uh, kind of personal knowledge assistant that can answer questions about Haystack, and it also helps you write Haystack code. And we're doing that with Haystack, and then um, on the model side, we'll be using uh, GPT in two variants. All right. So when you come to that um, aim of building a personal assistant with large language models, I don't know who of you has maybe played with ChatGPT, probably everyone. And you saw maybe also the examples where um, it was pretty exp impressive, but then it didn't exactly do what you wanted it to do. And some of the problems you might face when you uh, want to use ChatGPT or GPT-3 or GPT-4 for something that is actually useful are hallucinations, outdated knowledge, and also kind of running it on your own data. And I'm going to talk about each of these problems very briefly, and then we jump into um, how to tackle them all at once. All right, hallucinations. Uh, what is a hallucination? Um, a very simple definition would be when a language model makes things up, we call that a hallucination. So generally, these are responses from large language models where uh, it generates some text that isn't really true, maybe. Um, maybe it even hasn't ever seen exactly that text in its training data, and it's just not the answer to your question, maybe, as well. So it hallucinates something which you really don't want when you want to put these models into production. Um, an example of that is here I'm asking uh, ChatGPT to code with Haystack. I'm not entirely sure if that's readable, but briefly, on the left-hand side, I, I'm asking it uh, to generate Haystack code, actually. Um, 
and it should just initialize the prompt node, with a, which is our kind of abstraction layer around large language models where you can use them interchange, inter interchangeably. And it generates some code for me. Um, so I can see I'm asking, OK, please initialize a prompt node with an OpenAI model. And I see it gets an API key from OpenAI. Uh, it defines a model engine with text DaVinci 2. That's not, mo not the most recent model, but it's a fine choice, so why not? Um, and then it also um, creates a prompt for me here, ask a question about a topic and get an answer. And then it initializes a prompt node, passing model prompt and max sequence length of 512 to that node. And that actually looks kind of plausible. It even explains the code below. Um, but this code will never run because it's completely made up. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see a snippet from our documentation uh, using ChatGPT with the prompt node. And as you see, the, the differences are minor, but you need to pass a model name or path to the model, uh, to the prompt node. You directly need to pass the API key. Max sequence length doesn't exist, and that's interesting as well because 512 is kind of has always been the canonical max sequence length for transformers, but actually OpenAI models they don't have that limitation. It's more like 8,000, 32,000. So uh, that's not true at all, and it's probably something it just has seen very often in its training data. Um, yeah, so this basically is what we call a, a hallucination. Um, next problem, outdated knowledge. Um, you've probably all seen this response from ChatGPT, like as a large language model trained by OpenAI, blah, blah, blah. My cutoff date is uh, in September 2021 which means that without modifications, this LLM will only make predictions or can only like give you information, let's say, um, that actually have been part of its original training data. So whenever you're kind of prompting the model for its own knowledge, for its world knowledge, I don't know, ask who the president of some country is or whatever, um, it might give you information back, but unless um, it hasn't changed, like that information um, might be just like outdated. And one example of that might be, I'm actually um, going to, to PyCon US uh, tomorrow. And so I asked like, where's PyCon US this year? And it says, it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then that's interesting. It's like from May 1st until May 9th, 2020. So you can already see that ChatGPT doesn't really have a notion of what year we're in. It doesn't know it's 2023. And I actually checked, and PyCon in 2020 was supposed to be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But then there was this other thing that happened in 2020, um, which made pretty much any conf conference impossible to, to take place in person, and that was COVID. And in a small screenshot there, you can see that PyCon 2020 um, will be happening online, and it was happening online and not in Pittsburgh. So you can see that somehow ChatGPT had in its training data that PyCon US 2020 will be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not in May, by the way, in April, but it kind of got half of it correct until things changed. Um, and this will be happening very often. Whenever you run such a model in production, you cannot really update it in a way that um, you kind of give the new knowledge um, via training into its parameters. That doesn't really work. It's not really feasible. It would be very costly. Um, so you will need to find some other strategy. And then um, the next problem you might want the model to run on your own data. Um, and why would you want to do that? Let's say you work um, at some company, you have some obscure internal framework, 
that you developed. And you also have some documentation, but of course that's not public. And if you're a developer and you want to kind of make a QA system on that documentation, you will need to give that documentation to GPT somehow. And of course, there's one aspect is this whole like privacy and actually keeping corporate secret secret thing. Um, I'm not covering that here, uh, but you definitely, if you want to give that data to OpenAI, you need to find some way uh, to add that data at inference time, basically. And here's an example of uh, ChatGPT not having access um, to any internal data. So here I'm asking ChatGPT what one of our company values is, DeepSet's company values, and it gives me something that might be the company value of any um, generic startup uh, out there, but it's actually not one of ours, so it's not like the value um, uh, it gave me back as an answer here. Instead, one of our values is make others shine, always go the extra mile for the open source community, and help every, everyone um, basically achieve their goals and try to make them shine. And of course, GPT cannot know that because that's only in our internal um, knowledge base, basically. So there's no way that this answer could be correct. Unless we have generic values that every startup has, then yes, maybe. Um, all right. So how can you act actually um, solve these problems? One way to tackle all of these problems is um, what used to be called retrieval augmented generation as a concept that has been around at least for like two or three years, I don't know. Um, and basically what you do is you give um, GPT access to some other external knowledge base. And here's how that might look like. So that's a bit complex, but I'm going to break it down for you. So um, RAG, that's Retrieval Augmented Generation. And what you see here uh, at the top is a query that I want to feed into the system. So how will Google actually change its search strategy um, to beat its emerging competition, um, emerging from the, from the current wave of generative AI? Uh, something that people at Google might be asking themselves. And of course, ChatGPT, if we would just ask for that, it would make something up or it would say, I don't have any knowledge of recent events, something like that. Um, so what we do is we run that query against a database of knowledge um, that we collected beforehand. So here um, I'm running on, let's say, news articles, and I actually ask that question and I get back the most relevant documents. And what we call this is the retrieval step. So you can use a retriever, um, a search component, which um, actually gets for a question relevant data from a knowledge base. So classic search, basically. Um, you can have that in different complexities. You can use simple keyword search. You can use something like TF-IDF or BM25. But of course, you can also use other language models and uh, convert your query to, into vectors and then use uh, vector embedding search. So this database then would be a vector database. And then what you do is, in the prompt for GPT, you have given this information and then you include a set of most relevant documents, answer the following question, and then you pass the question. And then you give that to GPT and based on that, it can generate a comp comprehensive answer, um, which is probably going to be true. And um, the nice thing about this is that it can synthesize information from many different documents. So it's a bit different from like what we've seen in extractive uh, QA, for example. And it's also different because some companies might want to have more this conversational experience for their searches. And of course, it sounds like a human talking to you when you actually um, have GPT generating answers. And if they're true, um, even better. All right. Um, 
And I want to put this into practice now, and this is going to be a bit dense, but I hope um, it will not scare you off. Okay, so what we'll be building is a personal assisting, assistant using OpenAI's text da Vinci 3 model, so that's 3.5, and we'll be proceeding step by step, and we only give some code as a starter, just a few lines really, and then we're, we're going to let the model build up the whole system on its own. And I'm just gonna walk you through this. I'm not gonna run it actually, because I don't wanna rely on the OpenAI API right now, and also, Answers are non-deterministic, so there might be a few changes, and we actually um, would have to execute the code directly coming from there, so I don't want to debug here live in front of you. That would be way too stressful. Um, so, all right, then let's go. At first, we initialize a prompt node using the text of Vinci 3 model, and as I said, um, that's our abstraction around a large language model. You also could swap that for another model like GPT-4, ChatGPT, Cohere, or open source models. Um, we are also using a prompt template. You can see that here. And the prompt template um, is pretty powerful in Haystack because you can kind of enrich that template with other information. So you can use a Python F string like syntax in the in the template to feed information from other nodes that might be in the pipeline into that template so that you can then pass it to GPT. In our case, we have a direct template. I'm not adding any information. I just directly pass the user instruction to GPT. And then I initialize our prompt node, uh, setting the template, giving it the OpenAI key. Uh, setting a max length, and that's it, basically. Okay, next, I want to give some initial context to our model, because if I now ask it just to generate code for me, you've seen that before, it would make things up, and I actually want to have working code, so I'm going to give it some initial context, and what I'm giving it here is some just one page from our documentation, and that page is the crawler documentation. What does the crawler do? It allows you to scrape text from websites, and then using a so-called indexing pipeline, you can convert that text into documents, doing some pre-processing, and then store it in a document store. Uh, a document store might be a vector database, like a face document store, quadrant document store, but you can also use something like Elasticsearch Document Store, um, which uh, just has like, um, yeah, has both actually, DM25, so sparse and dense retrieval. Okay, so here's that crawler documentation. It's just a string. It has a lot of code examples in it because we believe that developers need good documentation with code examples. And then the next thing I'm doing here is I pass a list of URLs as well, and that list are additional uh, documentation pages from Haystack. And then our first instruction is, given this documentation, and I give in the string, write a crawler node that crawls the following URLs, and then I give it the URLs, and then I give it some in instructions on pre-processing as well. Uh, so it should index these documents in an indexing pipeline, and it should split full pages into 600 word chunks. That will make it easier for our retrieval component. And as you can see here, I'm actually uh, generating that code. And then what I want to do, because it's code coming from somewhere else, I really want to inspect that before running it on my machine. Uh, so I just have here the markdown output of this generated code. And you can see it's instantiating a document store, it has my list of URLs. Um, it has the right pre-processing, so 600 word splits, and everything is just generated, and uh, it looks pretty much correct. And when I go and execute that code, it actually runs. Um, so it's running, and it goes to these documentation pages, scrapes the text, indexes it into my document store, 
and I have more to work with. All right. Um, now is the second bit of code that I wrote myself. Um, that's the retriever. So I just initialize a BM25 retriever, so no embeddings, just very simple uh, TFIDF-like search. And then I uh, give it one query, how to use the prompt node in a pipeline. So I want to build that system with a prompt node in a pipeline, that query pipeline that I need for my personal assistant. And then our next natural language instruction to the model is using the snippet from the documentation, top result on how do I use the prompt node in a pipeline, um, initialize a pipeline with the prompt node, a pet, and a prompt template, and it should like answer a question about technical documentation, and then I give it some instructions, say it should be GPT 3.5 Turbo as a model, that's chat GPT, um, and I tell it where it can find the API key and stuff like that. And then I generate that code, again, that's here, so two lines, just the code generated, I inspect it again in Markdown, and you can see it has a prompt template which says, answer the given question using the provided context. Your answer should be in the style of technical documentation and should provide example code snippets if necessary, format code as Markdown Python code. And then here you can see that placeholder syntax, so it joins the top result documents basically together, and then it passes the question, and then it should produce an answer. And then the rest of the code looks perfect as well, so it initializes another prompt node, pipeline v2 this time, adds the nodes, so it has the two components, a retrieval augmented generation pipeline at the, on the query side, has two components, retriever and prompt node, basically, and a document store, but that's kind of baked into the retriever. And when I execute that code, I can actually try it out afterwards. So now I have my system, I have knowledge from the Haystack documentation indexed into a document store, I have my query pipeline set up, and now I ask, what is Haystack? Haystack is a Python library that provides a modular and extensible interface for building end-to-end -end search pipelines. Very good, sounds totally accurate. And then I give it one more question, um, so I ask, how do I use the prompt node with open source models? Because some of you might ask that. I don't want to use open AI, I want to use open source. And it actually generates me a response using Flan T5 models. They are open source. And it actually also generates these code snippets here as examples. So that's technical documentation for me that just works uh, perfectly. All right. And I think that's, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, you can Yeah, thank you for this talk. <clears throat> Super interesting. And we got questions already on Slido, perhaps also in the audience. I'll start with Slido questions. So um, could I use this IT with a local running alpaca? So um, not GPT on remote or so, just for security reasons or something else? Um, I think right now in the prompt node, we kind of limit um, some things to model that work, that we've tested, that work really well. Um, and I think Alpaca doesn't work for some things, but it's very easy to integrate. You need mm -hmm. to change a little thing, and then it's, uh, it should work. Um, and we're also adding more and more models uh, once we've tested them and say, like, that's something that works, we add it. And I think Alpaca or Llama will be available soon as well. So Cool. And is the Jupyter Notebook available on GitHub? Yes. Uh, yes, it's, it's okay, uh, on the link, or? It's there, yeah, yeah, GitHub. Perfect. Is there a question other than the audience? I can pass the microphone. Yes, there. Hi. So what would you use, like, if you want to support German as a language uh, with this all the chat GPT stuff is in English, the examples. How would you add translation to the whole model? Um, we do work with uh, customers from Germany. Um, and uh, we have one, for example, they're currently in a pilot for a generative AI pipeline. All the data is in German, and GPT just works. No need for translation. So it's, it's a bit 
I'd say it's a bit less grammatical sometimes. So basically, the English variant never makes mis mistakes. German sometimes, but it's very good still. Cool. Actually, I got this to slide, but I don't know why. It's not there. Uh, my question is, why should I use Haystack instead of the retrieval plugin of OpenAI if I'm using OpenAI models? I think if you're, if you're only using OpenAI models and you just care for that specific part of like retrieval um, and model, you might use OpenAI, but probably um, you want to get the data somehow into your document uh, database. I think um, that is left to the user with OpenAI plugins. You need to handle that somehow. You might want to have pre-processing. You might want to use different models as well. Compare a few, for example. And I'd say with Haystack, you're set up for the future and don't have, like, you're not locked into that open AI ecosystem. So one more question on Slido. Can you compare Haystack versus Langchain? Yeah, definitely. So I think uh, most people have heard about Langchain. It pretty much does the same um, when it comes to uh, working with large language models. So a wrapper around the most popular APIs, a few open source models, unified interface to query them. Um, I think where Haystack differs is that we've been around for some time and um, actually the whole tooling for like bringing these cool conce concepts to production um, are very well tested in Haystack. So actually looking at this, okay, end to end, how do I bring that to production now with all the different components? I think that's just where we have a lot of experience. But they're very similar frameworks. So I'd say try both out and see what you like. There was a question here, I think. Um, hi, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I wasn't quite able to find the Jupyter Notebook on the GitHub page. C could you like, Click uh, I think it's like it's like haste. Uh, it's it's like the only notebook in there. Really? Because uh, I, I thought so there was like twenty three of them. No, there's. I mean, there's haste uh, tutorials, but here in this repo, there's only like this. Oh, that one. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, and last question. I think because the time is short. Um, what kind of speed up can you? Ex no, that's an old one. Um, Bup, 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 bup. No, I'm just a bit lost, so sorry, it's my first, uh, third one. Um, is it expensive to use Haystack in terms of tokens? Uh, Haystack is free. Look, that's But good. if you call OpenAI, you have to pay for OpenAI. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so what lies ahead in the Haystack roadmap? Um, so currently, we are working on a few things. Um, we've built out our agent support, and we want to build that out more, so uh, language models acting even more autonomous, autonomously. But then we also want to focus more on really streamlining that end-to-end -end deployment experience, um, having like updating our REST API a little bit. And then um, soon, this year definitely, we'll be looking at Haystack 2.0, where we want to um, make our pipelines even better and more flexible and faster, easier to maintain. Um, yeah. So thank you. The time is over. There are a lot of questions on Slido which remain, but I think you're still here, and perhaps yes. you can also look in Slido yes. and answer them. So thank you very much for your talk. I think it's another applause. Yeah.